Well, hooray for better weather. Thank you all for <laughs> Good evening, my name is Ben Dworkin. <clears throat> I am the director of the Rebovich Institute for New Jersey Politics. And on behalf of the Rebovich Institute and Ryder University, welcome to tonight's program, an evening with the Honorable Stephen M. Fulop, Mayor of Jersey City. In just a moment, our guest will come up to give his remarks. Uh, when he is done, we will uh, still have some time. We're starting a bit late because he wanted to say hi to everybody. Um, but when he's done, we'll have some time for questions uh, from the audience. Um, please know that we are recording this, and therefore everything that is said uh, is, should be assumed is on the record. At the appropriate time, uh, when we're ready for the Q&A, if you have a question, please raise your hand. We ask that you wait for one of the three uh, Ryder students who will be holding wireless microphones. If you get picked by the mayor, wait for them to come with a microphone. It's not so much that we, you might be a tremendous uh, speaker and be able to project, but we want to record it properly, so please just wait for the microphone and then uh, ask your question. As is our tradition here uh, at Ryder, the first two questions will come from Ryder students. So you guys know who you are. Come up with good ones, okay? <laughs> 83 years ago last week, just 83 years ago last week, Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis wrote a rather brilliant dissent in a Supreme Court decision describing the states as laboratories of government. These states, he said, they may try novel social and economic experiments without risk to the rest of the country. Now, over 83 years, government has gotten bigger and more complicated, just as our nation has done. So today, it's a little bit different. Today, and especially in New Jersey, it is the municipalities that are the laboratories of government, and perhaps none more so than Jersey City, pushing forward with new ideas to see what works and what doesn't. Those, <coughs> excuse me, those like Mayor Fulop, who have served in the United States Marines, <clears throat> they learn the mantra, excuse me. <clears throat> People like Mayor Fulop, who have served in the Marines, learn the mantra that you never leave a fellow soldier behind. The mayor has launched his experimentation in his city by integrating this concept into city government itself, a city that leaves no resident behind. We are honored to have him here this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the mayor of Jersey City, the Honorable Stephen M. Fulton. Let me start by saying thank you uh, for having me here today. Can you hear me okay in the back? Okay, beautiful. All right, so, so um, let, let me just say thank you to a couple people before we start with kind of some formal comments and talk about some of the different things that are uh, important as it relates to Jersey City, as it relates to the students who are here at Ryder and uh, kind of direct direction and some of the things that are happening across the state today. Um, before we start, I do want to say thank you to Ben for inviting me. This is the second time, um, the first time it snowed. And for those of you that were committed to that date and decided to come again, I thank you. Those of you that um, weren't, I wouldn't know it, so I say thank you anyway. <laughs> and uh, let me also recognize there are a couple elected officials, uh, councilmen uh, here. Um, we have a Board of Education member, my buddy Chris Scales, stand up, the youngest guy in the state of New Jersey. <laughs> that uh, in a matter of time, we will all be working for Chris Scales. I really do believe that. Um, and then um, let me just say again, thank you for all of you for coming out tonight. And really, um, it speaks to the importance of uh, what's happening in New Jersey and you taking time out of your busy schedules to listen to one of the mayors uh, in New Jersey. Um, who I think is, uh, has a city that really is on the move in many ways. Um, I was given an agenda today, I get notes when I come here as far as um, 
what the format is for this, generally speaking, and uh, they said that uh, you could speak for 45 minutes, and uh, that's not going to happen, rest assured. Um, I, I will tell you that uh, you know, brevity is important. I'm going to digress for a quick second, because I th certainly think that for the students and the elected officials in here, um, just to highlight why brevity is important and not uh, speaking for 45 minutes. In my undergraduate years, I spent some time at Oxford University, and Oxford University actually does something very similar to this. Um, they do it several times during a semester, but um, a little bit of a different format. So Oxford is a one-to-one -one student to teacher ratio, really a phenomenal way to learn. Um, and then several times during the semester, they have these Oxford Union where the 35 different colleges come together and uh, they bring in a famous actor or athlete or thought leader or physicist or somebody who's really kind of shaping the global dialogue. And uh, brevity is key. They'll speak for about 10 minutes, per se. And then um, you'll, they'll engage in an aggressive dialogue and kind of a cue. And I think that's probably going to be helpful here today. When I was there, I had the chance to see the former Secretary of State speak, James Baker, who's not a short-winded individual. And uh, about an hour into his comments, um, this is the lesson learned, uh, a student actually got up and started to rustle around and put his hat on and his jacket on and uh, actually made a scene in a room very similar to this. So if you could think of it from this sense, it would be somebody at this table putting on their jacket and their hat and really moving around and in the course of the conversation. James Baker actually stopped his conversation and said, um, excuse me, you're being extremely disruptive. What could possibly be so important? And the student, um, rather than saying excuse me, actually responded and said, I need to leave. I need to excuse myself. I need to get a haircut. And, uh, <laughs> and James Baker said, um, listen, I'm a little older than um, all of you in this room, and uh, so I'll feel comfortable saying this because I think it's a lesson for life. He said that if you think you need to get a haircut or something like that, the right thing to do is not to be disruptive in something like this. So the right thing to do is to either schedule it before or after so you're not so disruptive. And the student, to his credit, it's Oxford, said, that makes sense. He said, when this started, I didn't need a haircut. <laughs> so brevity, brevity is, uh, is crucial here. So you know, first, I kind of want to highlight, um, before I talk about some of the things that are happening in Jersey City, I do want to talk a little bit to the students who are here. Um, how many students do we have here? If you guys could raise your hands. Don't be shy. And then how many of you are actually thinking of going into uh, elected office? OK. That's good. And then how many of you just maybe into government in some sort of service capacity, maybe not on the elected side? OK, so a handful of you as well. So you know, I wanted to start off by sharing a little bit about kind of my background, as in many ways, I actually view me coming here today and speaking um, as the mayor of Jersey City and being in elected office for 10 years, in some ways, as an accidental mayor, I would say, that if you asked me 11 years ago, if I would be standing here today, if this was on the trajectory that I was headed to, I would have said there is literally no chance that this is where I would have ended up. And I want to kind of share with you kind of how that happened, and uh, because I think there's some lessons that are really important for the students there as it relates to convictions of what you believe is important for you to shape your future and willing to kind of step forward in that direction despite what other people say. So a little bit about my background come from a family of Holocaust survivors. My grandmother, it's Women's History Month, my grandmother was the most amazing person I ever knew in the sense that uh, she was in Auschwitz for a period of time. Um, she lost her daughter in the gas chamber, or she lost her mother in the gas chamber, um, and when she was liberated by the Russians, she, uh, she subsequently, several years later, had a stroke. And uh, so half her body was paralyzed at 30 years old, and nevertheless, she raised a terrific family. I'm fortunate to be a byproduct of that immigrated to this country. And uh, when you think about women's contributions in Women's History Month, I usually look to my grandmother as somebody that you know, really picked up where most people would have quit. And uh, so me, as a first generation born here, um, I went to Binghamton in my undergrad. And then after that, I got a job at Goldman Sachs. It's a great place to work. And you can imagine the pride and excitement that my parents had when their son got a job at Goldman Sachs being that my parents owned a deli in Newark. My parents are still in Newark every single day for the last 40 years. My mom and my dad have an immigration services business there. And uh, I was working at Goldman. I was there for two years. And uh, I was about two blocks away from 9-11 when uh, the World Trade Center hit, when the planes hit the World Trade Center, I was about two blocks away. And you could literally feel the building shake in the building that I was located at one New York Plaza. And subsequent to that, 
I made the decision to leave Goldman and enlist in the Marine Corps. And I tell you, when I look back today, I wasn't registered to vote, wasn't involved in any of this stuff, but what I thought at the time was that military service or service was a partial payment for citizenship. That's how I viewed it. I was thankful for what I had, what this country had given my family, and I viewed it as an opportunity to give a little bit back, or maybe give a lot back, but whatever it was, I was willing to serve. So I signed up for the Marine Corps, and that was a major decision and a major turning point in my life, because I tell you that everybody I spoke to told me it was something that I shouldn't do, that it was something that maybe somebody else should do, that it was something that I would be giving up a career at Goldman Sachs to do. And when I look back today, that decision paved the way for a next decision, which opened the door for where I am today. And what's that? So if you think back 11, 12 years ago, what was happening on the political landscape in the state of New Jersey was Senator Lautenberg retired for the first time from the United States Senate. And at the time, the congressman for Hudson County was Congressman Menendez. And he was the most senior Latino in the entire country. He was the chairman of the Democratic Caucus. He was the most senior person in New Jersey. And he thought at the time, those of you who follow this, I know a lot of you do, some of the younger people may not remember this, but he thought at the time that he would ascend to become the United States Senator at that point in time. And what happened was John Corzine retired from Wall Street, paid $60 million, and you, one would argue in some ways kind of the money muscled out Bob Menendez and he became a U.S. Senator. And uh, Bob Menendez at the time said, I need to get more involved in local politics and build some relationships there that are even stronger. And he helped at the time get elected the first African-American mayor ever in the history of Jersey City, Glen Cunningham. And it was kind of a merger and a relationship between the Latino community and the African-American community that made that possible. And subsequent to that, those of you who remember, six, seven months later, they started to fight very publicly. In the paper, their relationship deteriorated. Me, I was in Iraq. I was doing what I was supposed to do, deployed, not involved in any of this stuff, didn't know any of it. I came back from Iraq and uh, I was invited to City Hall by Glenn Cunningham. And he invited every military person that went overseas to City Hall to give them a city proclamation. That's what he would do. He was a Marine as well. He just wanted to say thank you. So we were on the stage for City Hall, and he's reading my proclamation, which is hanging on my wall today in City Hall. And he's fascinated by the fact that I would leave Goldman Sachs to enlist in the Marine Corps. I went to his office, and he asked a lot of questions. How was the service? What did you see? What was this like? What was that like? And it was no different than what a lot of people were asking me. Family, friends, business people, they were living in some ways vicariously through the, the circumstances. And I didn't mind sharing it. Didn't think anything of it. The relationship continued to deteriorate. And about five months later, I was leaving Goldman. I was back at Goldman. And I got a phone call, and uh, it was a deputy mayor. And uh, deputy mayor gets on the phone and says, Steve, the mayor would like to speak to you. I said, OK, that's strange, but sure. <laughs> And uh, Cunningham got on the phone, and he says to me, Steve, you know, I'd like to make some time for you to come to City Hall. I'd like to talk to you. And so I'm going to digress for a second. That Monday, the previous Monday, I actually called the Mayor's Action Bureau, which is the complaint office in City Hall, to complain about a parking situation. I, I was that guy, OK? <laughs> and so, uh, so I complained on the Monday. So the mayor called me and says, I'd like you to come to talk to you. And I said to the mayor, I said, listen, uh, Mayor Cunningham, I said, I've got to work tomorrow. I can't come to City Hall, but I'm really inspired that you call me personally about my parking issue. It's terrific. <laughs> and uh, he said, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> so we came to a conclusion on the time to come in the following day after work. And uh, I go in, and we go into his office, and he says the following things to me. We're in there. It's uh, his group of supporters or friends on the political front. And I didn't know who any of them were. I wasn't involved, wasn't registered. They didn't know what a county committee person is, or a freeholder was, or who my board of education members were. I didn't know any of it. And he starts talking to me about elected office and service, and how great it can be. And he starts talking to me about generally, in the course of elected office, people lose before they win, is what he said. And he said, whether you're John F. Kennedy, or George Bush, or Al Gore, or Bill Clinton, you lose before you win. But it's part of a process that people go through. And, uh, and then he says to me, look, this coming June primary, he said, Bob Menendez is going to run a whole slate of candidates. He's going to run himself for Congress. He's up again. Then there's going to be someone for county clerk, county surrogate, committee seats underneath. Cunningham says to him, he says, we're going to run a whole slate of candidates, meaning 
his Jersey City organization. We're gonna run somebody for Congress, somebody for county clerk, somebody for county surrogate, and then committee seats underneath. And so it does take a genius at this point to realize he's about to pitch on something. And so I, if you knew what I was doing in my life at the time, I was trying to get my career back. I was finishing a master's at Columbia, another master's at NYU at the same time. I was finishing my reserve duty. I didn't have any interest in any of this stuff. And so he says to me the following. He says, look, what I think I'm gonna tell you can help you long term in your life. Um, and I think that you might enjoy it and find the benefits to it, but it's not a winning proposition. So he said, here's what I'd like to do. I'll help you raise some money. I'll help you with some people. I want you to run for Congress against Bob Menendez. And <laughs> so, see, so you guys think it's funny. I, I, I was flattered. No, I, I, I actually, so I asked him to repeat it. And uh, he, said, he said it again. And uh, I said, well, let me think about it, Congressman, and I'll get back to you. And I left, and I called my parents and my friends, and I said, I just had the weirdest conversation ever. And they said, what happened? I just told them what I just told you. And uh, everybody had the same reaction to me. They, they said, are you sure that's what the mayor said to you? And I said, yeah, I'm telling you. And then I called them back Monday, and that's when I registered to vote. And, and, uh, and I told them I would do it. And the reason I did was because I thought that I would tell my grandkids one day that uh, I ran for office. I thought it was something that, you know, a bucket list sort of thing that you would say that you really had a chance to do this and I was part of a process. I didn't know anything about it. And so the campaign ensues, and uh, what I learned during that campaign, which I didn't expect, is that despite what people think about elected officials and all these different stereotypes, that in many ways it really is a noble profession, that you really can effectuate change and you really can change people's lives. And I think that in Jersey City, we are doing that in a meaningful way. And I tell you to the students here going back that when I look at the two decisions to go into the military and the one to, despite what people said, you probably shouldn't get involved in this congressional race running against Bob Menendez, right? Those two things, everybody virtually told me they weren't the best decisions to make. And in, in hindsight, I followed what I thought was the best decision and ultimately they ended up being the right thing. And I say that to the students here because the way I kind of view what you are doing here, whether some of the students on the graduate level or the undergraduate level, is yeah, the coursework is great and the testing could be difficult and some of the relationships are great, but ultimately what you're really building here is an ability to fail and get back up. And you're building a support network of confidence, of people that you can try different things and be willing to experiment and really push yourselves because the skill set that you're developing here is really, really significant. And if there's anything that I could share from my background is that you should be willing to try different things because I tell you when I look back 11 years, I wouldn't be here today if I didn't have the willingness to do that. So that's the first thing I just wanted to share. I want to talk a little bit about Jersey City because I think what's happening in Jersey City today is really, really exciting. And when we came in, um, we came in from a simple mindset that we wanted to change Jersey City by the end of this term to be on par with one of the best mid-sized cities in the country. So we'll set lofty goals and everything we do, we think big. That's kind of the way we approach everything. We try to tackle big problems, we try to have big ideas, and then we try to figure out how to piece them together. And what I like to think that we're doing in Jersey City that's different than anywhere else is recognizing that stereotypes can be broken down. So if you think about kind of some of the most basic stereotypes that exist are that people would say that if you are a Republican, right, you are focused on the economy, you're focused on business, you're focused on um, employment numbers, and you're focused on that 1%. If you are a Democrat, you're focused on social issues, you're focused on the environment, you're focused on um, poverty issues, you're focused, you're more socially conscious. And people would have you believe that you're either one or the other. And what we're trying to show in Jersey City is that that is a false choice in every sense of the word. That those two things are not mutually exclusive. That you can drive a very, very, very strong local economy and at the same time do things that are very progressive and socially conscious and they can coexist in a very meaningful way. If you look at what's happened in Jersey City over the last two years, it is one of the great stories on that front, I would argue, in the entire country. You look at what's happening on our construction front. For the second year in the row, we are leading the state of New Jersey on construction starts. We are building big, 17 of the 20 largest buildings in the entire state of New Jersey in the next four years, each will be in Jersey City. 
We're building big. We're building 70 stories. We're building 80 stories. We will be breaking ground this year on a 95-story building, which is the largest residential building in North America outside of New York City. It's going to change the entire skyline. We are lowering taxes last year. This year, taxes are flat. Next year, again, I could tell you taxes will be flat or lower because we have some visibility into that stuff. You look at our unemployment rate. It has dropped faster than the state, faster than the nation, faster than any city in the entire region. So it would be hard to argue on that economic front that Jersey City isn't doing things than doing things in a big, big way. And at the same time, we are doing things that I think are really important to make sure that everybody <coughs> shares in the progress that's happening there. We were the first in the state of New Jersey, the first and the sixth in the entire country, President Clinton actually came to visit us and highlighted this, to do paid sick leave. And it's kind of something that the business community initially pushed back on. Today, we actually had a report from Rutgers that did a survey of it to kind of assess what happened to the business community. And the premise of why we did that was pretty simple, to say that people should not have to be fearful that they will lose 20% of their weekly pay in the case they have to care for a sick or loved one. So that choice between caring for a sick loved one and losing 20% of your pay is something that people shouldn't have to make because most of you in this room take it for granted that you don't have to make it. And the reality of the situation is I could tell you now in places like Jersey City, now in places like Newark, in places like Montclair, in places like Trenton, that is a choice that people will not have to make. I tell you also we're doing things like on the ACA. When people were running away from the Affordable Care Act, Jersey City was running towards it. We have signed up 10% of the people in the entire state of New Jersey, and of the entire state's numbers, 10% of them are from Jersey City, despite the fact that we're 2% of the state's population. Why? Because we made a concerted effort to do it. Such a concerted effort that President Obama has highlighted us on many times. They've actually sent six cabinet members, six, in the last year and a half to Jersey City because it is a place that they could highlight much of what I'm telling you today. We're doing things on gun reform that I think are really significant. As Ben said, the laboratories for change are at the municipalities and the cities. We think about what we're doing on guns. Today, when you look about what's happening in Trenton or Washington, nothing is happening there on that front. Even after Newtown, a horrible, horrible situation there, you look at what happened subsequent to that, nothing. You actually look what happened nationally, nationally, you actually, the gun, the pro-gun lobbyist is actually winning the dialogue. Laws became less stringent after Newtown as opposed to more stringent. So what are we doing in Jersey City? Reasonable approach. We said outside of the US military, right, who are the biggest purchasers of ammunition per year, of guns per year? It's law enforcement. It's police departments. And so we had a little experiment. We said, is basic capitalism, if market economics can impact how people respond to RFPs on who we purchase from. So we did an experiment. We said, if you want to be the vendor that is with Jersey City, you need to do respond to X, Y, and Z. Tell us how you're going to resell the guns that we return to you. Tell us your view on assault weapons in regular people's hands, et cetera, et cetera. The first time we put that out there, the first time we put that out there, nobody responded because the NRA took a very aggressive approach. Actually, Scott Bach, who's a national board member of the NRA, responded that I should know better as my grandparents are Holocaust survivors, I should know the importance of guns. And, and you know, the reality of the situation is when I look at my family, I know that had my grandparents had guns, um, I probably wouldn't be here today. But it shows the ignorance of kind of that comment ultimately. So we put it back out again and we got started to get responders from vendors because once the first responded, the second one was interested in the business. Now Jersey City can't change the gun dialogue by itself. We're not foolish to think that, but Jersey City, Seattle, Pittsburgh, New York City can start to shape that. New York City has 30,000 police officers. It's a small army, small army, every year buying millions of dollars worth of ammunition, of guns, of firearms. They can start to shape the dialogue. So I tell you that Jersey City is a place that we are actually are making change. Tomorrow, I'm excited that we are having, and you're all welcome, Governor McGree will shoot me for saying this, but you are all welcome to attend. It will be our second annual prisoner reentry conference. Governor McGreevy joined our team a year and a half ago to focus on prisoner reentry. We wanted to create in Jersey City a national model on how we deal with prisoners that are returning from the prison system, the jail system, back to cities like Jersey City. It's an issue that impacts every urban area in America. In Jersey City, we have 2,000 people per year that come out of the jail system and come back to Jersey City. 
And so we gotta think about how do you deal with those people. 70% of those people have addiction problems. And then they have housing problems. And of course, employment issues. So we're dealing with all three components of it because we recognize that this country has a major issue. You have 5% of the world's population and you have 25% of the incarcerated people living in this country, the United States of America. Think about that, we have more people in the jail system, more African Americans in the jail system in this country right now then South Africa had blacks in the jail system in the height of apartheid. There is a problem in that, and you need to start to figure out how to correct that. So in Jersey City, we are doing it differently. We're focused on addiction, we're focused on employment, we're focused on housing, and we're breaking that cycle, and we are having an impact. Tomorrow, in Jersey City, there'll be 500 people that attend that. Paul Fishman will be attending it as well. Some of the biggest academics um, in the country on this will be attending it, because it's a topic that we are very focused on, on solving. Mike Tyson will be there. He's not really an academic, but he's, gonna, he's coming as well. But uh, he's, our, he's our lunchtime speaker. But nevertheless, nevertheless, you all are invited to that because I would like to highlight in Jersey City we really are doing things that are meaningful, showing that it's a false choice between one and the other. So with that, I just want to say thank you for coming out. And I think the best way to go about this is probably a dialogue and questions. And we'll get our two questions from Ryder students and then the broader community. And uh, again, thank you for coming. And uh, look forward to the further conversation. OK, so we have three students who are going to hold the wireless mics. You guys can get them. What's your name? Uh, Lee. Okay, Lee. Great. <coughs> Hello. Okay. I just want to start off by saying thank you, Mayor, for coming to Ryder University tonight. Uh, we really do appreciate it. Uh, that was a great story that you told us. Um, I'm glad that you brought the economic prosperity that Jersey City is currently experiencing. Um, I just wanted to note, do you believe that Jersey City is kind of leading the pathway into making New Jersey more of a business-friendlier environment for us to compete against states such as New York and Pennsylvania? Um, if so, how? Yeah, I, so we've changed the, you all heard the question, I assume, do you need me to repeat it? All right, we're good. The, uh, I, I would say that Jersey City in many ways is leading the charge. It's hard to argue otherwise when you look at the basic economic numbers that are coming out, and they're not numbers that we keep, whether it's construction starts, whether it's, uh, uh, employment numbers, last year we created 9,000 new jobs coming to Jersey City, 150 new businesses opened in Jersey City. Um, so we're really highlighting some of that stuff. We've changed some of our incentive programs in order to be re really more thoughtful on how we're approaching that stuff. And I'd like to think that some of the changes that have happened there are because of three things that we've done. A, our incentive program, we've changed our building department significantly, uh, leveraging technology a lot more. So we are recognizing that time is of value and we're moving things much, much, much quicker. And then we're marketing the city. We have a public-private partnership, $1.2 million, um, in northern New Jersey and New York City highlighting some of the things that we're changing. And so we're attracting a lot of businesses over here. We just received a, um, one of the things that I'm really excited about for 2015 going into 2016 is uh, we just received a two and a half million dollar grant from uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies. And uh, we, they issued it to 12 cities across the country. Jersey City is by far the smallest city that they gave it to, which really speaks to some of the things that we're doing. And the focus of this is gonna be Main Street revitalization. So our pitch to them was that Main Streets across the state of New Jersey, across the country, um, have changed in many ways. And that's maybe because of the internet, that's maybe because of millennials, how they shop, a lot of different reasons why that is. But I'm sure you're all familiar that when you drive some of the respective Main Streets in your towns, you'll see a lot of vacancies. And so it's a problem that we're looking to tackle in next year as it relates to the economics of the city and how we approach that. So um, I think over the last two years, we've done a lot. And then I think we still have a lot more to do over the next year. And we're really thinking about that. Yes. Hi. Uh, again, Mayor, thank you for coming. My name is Kenny. And uh, reports have just come out recently about how Republican governors, specifically Scott Walker and Chris Christie, have been simultaneously uh, profiting from and campaigning against the Affordable Health Care Act, and profiting from in different ways, not specifically personally, but 
Um, could you elaborate on in which ways these are good things or bad things, in which ways they affect the states themselves, and in what ways, how does this change your dialogue on the Affordable Health Care Act? We've been, look, I, I am a big believer that uh, that was important legislation, and uh, I think that uh, I see every day the impact it has on many of working families and struggling families in New Jersey. And, uh, and in Jersey City. We have 50,000 people that were uninsured. Uh, we've signed up a huge number of them, and uh, it has it having an impact on people's lives. There's no question about it. Um, we have been fierce advocates. We're gonna continue to be. We've had uh, people out that they, navigators is the title of the people that are out there um, in 10 different languages, literally going business by business to sign people up door by door, similar to what you would do as a political campaign in order to make sure that people are aware of what there is and we're pushing them through the process. So um, we've been at the forefront of it. And as like I said, you know, during the height of pushback when the website failed um, during the launch and uh, there was a lot of blowback everywhere, uh, Sibelius, um, who obviously the sec Secretary of uh, Health and Human Services, um, she did an event in Jersey City, literally at the height of it. And uh, it was a comfort area for them to send uh, Secretary Sebelius to Jersey City because we've embraced it. We recognize that it's important and you're changing people's lives. And I think that in 10, 20, 30, 40 years that they will look at this as monumental legislation that is as important as Social Security or any Medicare or Medicaid or any of it. Two questions. Any others? Every, everybody can ask them. Yeah, sure. <laughs> we'll start over here and then we'll work our way. Is that okay? Are there any environmental initiatives of which you are particularly proud? Can you hear the question in the back? The question was regarding uh, environmental issues of which we're particularly proud. Um, and uh, the short answer is yes. Let me, let me highlight some of the bigger pictures that's happening in Jersey City. So uh, our history is an industrial city, as many of you know. Uh, we had some of the worst brownfields in the entire country. Uh, two of the most significant cleanups are happening in Jersey City right now. The city was in litigation for decades with both PPG on one site. We continue to be in litigation in them, although cleanup is happening. And then Honeywell, um, which, will, which was the worst site of the two and uh, is going to be residential 4,000 units at the low end, 8,000 units if we get the light rail <laughs> extension. Um, so we are turning brownfields, literally brownfields, that will be residential areas, um, and we're very proud of that. We focused on green roofs. We're focused, we built more lead uh, buildings than anybody else in New Jersey. We're incentivizing that. Um, we're doing things like rainwater barrels. Uh, we're working with community groups like Sustainable Jersey City. Um, so, you know, we're very, very engaged in a lot of those sort of initiatives and very conscious of it. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty proud of that, actually. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Laurenti from, as we pronounce it locally, Trenton. <laughs> uh, first, a short factual question and then a more thoughtful substantive policy question. What percent of the vote did you get in challenging Bob Menendez for Congress, oh and did he ever forgive you? So, so the short answer is uh, yes, over time, we built a really, really substantive relationship. He has been um, instrumental to Jersey City in, um, in countless ways. You know, when you look at the light rail and uh, the Hudson Bergen light rail, uh, you'd be hard to argue that it wasn't a Bob Menendez initiative and he pushed that through in the 90s. When you look at us hiring some of our firefighters over the last two years, we've hired dozens upon dozens upon dozens of firefighters. They're hired via safer grants from the federal government. Um, I mean, the list goes on and gone, on and on. So, so the percent? Oh, <laughs> I, I, it's in the, it was in the teens. Okay. Low teens. All right, then the, the substantive policy no, the, question. The, the funny thing is, the funny thing, so uh, Mayor Cunningham actually passed away a week before that election. He was actually campaigning, and then we left at 9 o'clock, and then he had the heart attack and died. And uh, I was 25 at the time, so I was with some of my college buddies uh, who I played soccer with, they were kind of running my campaign. Like the same guy was my press spokesman, was my campaign manager, was hanging signs, we were all doing everything. And so 
uh, when the numbers came back, we didn't really know, I didn't know how any of this political stuff works. So when the numbers started to come back in that election night, you know, the first numbers came back in and they were fairly close. It must have been my neighborhood. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I actually thought for a second I had a chance. And then the, and then the avalanche started to just to come on. And it was pretty embarrassing, but nevertheless. So the, the policy question is this. Um, there had been some big push that has apparently now run out of steam for a gasoline tax increase to fund one particular area of state government services yeah. that is now uh, running uh, dry. But there's a vast range of other areas of state government that are also, quote, running dry. Uh, and while Jersey City has had the unusual position of being right next to New York, hence the, the economic uh, growth and all that, the Camdens, the Trentons, and others have been subject to what the Christie administration has called weaning away from state aid. That is uh, an effort to phase them out and have poor areas have to somehow make it on their own. How much of a priority do you see when we finally do get a new gubernatorial administration to making up these losses of money for urban, poor urban areas, for higher education, education, the whole gamut of things, or yeah. would you just take one issue separately at a time, like transportation right. that has a constituency? Do you see a big tax increase as inevitably part of the remedy? That's a very tricky question. <laughs> All right, so let, let me preface what I'm about to say that uh, I've been very mindful uh, not to engage too much into the whole state conversation unless it really impacts Jersey City. And uh, you could argue everything impacts Jersey City, obviously, but things to different degree when it's a specific target. So if, as an example, you know, some of you will discuss kind of the pension or health care benefits. We could talk about that as well. Um, you know, we'll have conversations, as I did, for example, today, with people from that pension board as it pertains to Jersey City. So as opposed to lobbying uh, the broader picture at this point, we're thinking about trying to understand more what certain things mean as they impact the people that I am with today. So let me start on that front. Um, as it relates to urban areas, I could tell you that uh, from the funding situation, to wean cities off entirely from uh, state aid, and uh, I, I don't think that's a realistic uh, outcome here, just looking at our tax base and some of the other urban area tax bases, I don't think you could get there, to be honest with you, based on the state budget and, and how municipalities are funded, not only Jersey City, and we're growing more than most, to be honest with you. Go right here. Yes. Hi, I'm Mary Capri. I live in Robbinsville and I write about health care. And I was at the event with Sebelius over a year ago, oh, actually. You were. Yeah, on a snowy day. Um, I'm curious whether the um, businesses who are interested in coming to Jersey City or are already there, do they comment or have any response to the number of people that you're signing up? Does it affect economic growth that you're signing up so many people for health care? So the, the, uh, the short answer is no, the businesses haven't uh, expressed any concern or appreciation one way or the other. Um, we are meeting more regularly now with um, uh, CarePoint Medical Center and the Jersey City Medical Center, now owned by Barnabas, to understand um, some of the economics of the ACA on reimbursements for them and the impacts because some of the state funding cuts have a huge impact and how they're able to care for people now. It's no longer charity care, how the ACA impacts that, um, and how some of these walk-in clinics that it seemed to be expanding in urban areas as opposed to the emergency room use, they're trying to kind of curtail that, how that impacts us overall. So it's a conversation that's happening kind of right now, let's say within the next month and a half, two months, and uh, I'd have a better picture for you after kind of getting a better picture from Dennis Kelly and Joe Scott. But it, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously very aware of it for the reason that, I mean, I'm hearing about it on a regular basis from them. Yes. Sure. Oh, no. Hi, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, Greg Chasar, a master's graduate, 78 from Ryder. Uh, my question relative uh, is that uh, Ryder has a sister school, which is uh, Westminster, and I'd like to hear your focus on the arts and uh, beautifying Jersey City to make it more attractive and what you're doing in those efforts. Okay, so um, the beautifying and the arts. So let, let me say a couple of things. On, on, we'll start, there's two different components there. We'll start on the arts front. So Jersey City is blessed 
that we have a tremendous arts community and, uh, and that's been a byproduct of a lot of different reasons. Some of it is proximity to New York, some of it has been cost over time, a lot of different reasons why that's happened. What we've lacked is major cultural institutions, so to speak, that become kind of destinations to kind of highlight uh, all of the great creative class that's happening in Jersey City. So it is a concerted effort from us to correct that. Now the answer is, the question is going to be how. Two things that we're focused on. So the first is that we are very close to a resolution on a major theater, a 3,000 person theater. It's bigger than NJ Pack, called the Friends of the Lowe's, uh, or called the Historic Lowe's. And uh, a community group called the Friends of the Lowe's is part of it right now. We're working through the economics of it. It'll be a $40 million renovation. And uh, it's a 1929 turn of the century uh, theater that uh, when you walk in there, it is magnificent. You're like in a time warp. It's similar to what Brooklyn just renovated and announced um, about two months ago, three months ago. It was a $100 million renovation there. So the Lowe's Corporation had five of these across the country, and uh, Jersey City is one of them. It still exists. Um, it's in need of certain repair. We have the money earmarked for it. Um, we are working through, we put out an RFP. Part of the situation, truthfully, has been that since the 1990s, um, a community group who I referenced earlier, the Friends of the Lowe's, um, who saved it from the mayor at the time demolishing it, uh, feel that they should be running it. And for the last five mayors have taken the same approach because of the politics of it, that they didn't want to engage in a back and forth with a, uh, with a community group politically treacherous to do from my side or from, the, uh, from a mayor seat. We took the approach two years ago saying that uh, I think ultimately for the greater good that we need to get professionals in there. Theaters are hard enough to manage uh, without, uh, under any circumstances. I'm going to put $40 million of taxpayer dollars into there. I need to maximize the chances of success. So our final court case or the court resolution is next month. Um, and hopefully from there we'll move it forward and you're going to start, you're going to have a major theater for performing arts. Um, in the last two years, we've seen the expansion and the city has worked with them of Mana Creative, which is a million square feet of artists and studio space. Um, if you aren't familiar with it, it's, uh, you should Google it. There's one in Chicago now, one in London now, one in Jersey City now. Genesis of it was art storage, then became the art storage to art display, some of the greatest artists in the entire world. And then there's 300 artists there that use it as their studio space to make the art. They're all professional artists, and they actually have gallery spaces across the river. But if you Google it and you see kind of the days that they actually have shows, all 300 <coughs> artists are open simultaneously, and you go, can go in and out of their studios. It's really an amazing day to see some terrific art. You could just Google that. It's really a great way to spend uh, the time. Um, we've dedicated a significant amount of resources uh, from city dollars into art programs. Um, our director of CDBG funding and community development is actually here. She's a writer graduate. She's right here. It has been a very, very high priority for us, and we've put a significant amount of dollars there as well. Um, I'm a big believer that uh, the creative class, so to speak, is what makes cities interesting, and you need those types of people in a city because, frankly, if everybody was um, you know, the same race, the same age, the same economic background, it's not an interesting place to live. Nobody wants to live in a place like that. Good stuff. Yes? My name is Barbara Wright, and I'm a former public official. I just wanted to thank you for your introduction of your experience to public service. I've served in an elected office for many years, and I think for the students to hear your story is very meaningful. Thank you. One of the things that impressed me about your background uh, is, is your academic background. And since we're in an institution of higher education, not all politicians or public servants uh, feel that education is an important part of it. Do you think that's played any role in helping you uh, in your career? And how would you talk to our students about why their education is important in public service? So uh, I'll highlight also some of the things we're doing in Jersey City on the educational front, because I think that's exciting as well. So uh, we'll, we'll do both of those. But um, yeah, I, I'd echo what I said earlier, that I think the greatest thing about uh, graduate degrees and, and, and the education opportunity in front of you beyond just what you learn from textbooks or professors is uh, a confidence and a skill set that you can fail. 
and it's a travesty if you don't try to push yourself and inevitably when you push yourself you will fail right and then you have the skill set to bounce back up from this sort of thing that you're learning here these type of educational facilities uh, opportunities so for me we try a lot of different things in Jersey City and I could highlight for you before when I was speaking some of the things that have worked and there's plenty of things that we've tried that haven't worked. That's the honest answer. But uh, we try it, we try to figure it out and if it doesn't work we try to fix it. But the skill sets from how to work with nonprofits and budgets and uh, uh, some of the policy initiatives, they're driven off of, of educational experiences that I have and, and it's a basis and foundation for a lot of what we do um, and how we hire to be honest with you. And on the education front, I, I just want to highlight, we're doing some things in Jersey City. We touched on earlier on the vocational front the, uh, that I'm most excited about is uh, something called Force 21. And again, this is kind of always pushing the envelope, and Jersey City will be the first in the state of New Jersey, I believe, to have a partnership program like this. We're working with NJIT. I'm going to explain to you kind of what it is, really. So it's based on the German model of education. So obviously, what is the German model? pretty simple that if you think about Germany overall, it is a unbelievable industrial company. They're focused on manufacturing. You're all familiar with German manufacturing. And at the same time that they have a thriving manufacturing industry, they are surrounded by, particularly on the eastern side, by low, co low cost wage. So there, you, there are employers in surrounding countries that can hire people for much cheaper in manufacture, yet Germany really perseveres and succeeds on the manufacturing front. German laws are very, very difficult also from an employer standpoint relative to some of the countries around it, yet at the same time, German manufacturing perseveres. So the question is why? They have a very simple way of kind of teaching that actually starts ultimately in sixth grade where they highlight the industry, they have apprenticeship programs with the private sector, and they work together between the apprenticeship programs and the schoolings from sixth grade forward. It's a, kind of like a vocational school in some ways to really make sure that they are teaching those kids towards a set job at the end of it. So we're partnering now, I think we have 10 different employers, major corporations that are part of what we're gonna be doing starting in sixth grade. It's gonna start actually at a middle school, going through, through the high school. Um, we're partnering with NJIT. You will get an associate's degree at the end of your senior year of high school. So it's actually gonna confront also uh, college affordability because if you wanna go on and, and pursue your bachelor's, it's only two years from there. And you'll graduate your senior years with a Siemens degree as well, which a Siemens certification is really crucial as well. So. It, it focuses on developing a skill set for these children that aren't, isn't always focused around college necessarily, but a, a job that they really can really use and leverage. <laughs> yes? Thank you. You mentioned the nonprofit sector. Yeah. And I, in many places, there's been a movement towards decreasing the investment or grant allocations to nonprofit organizations. And I'm wondering what types of investments and collaborations you're engaging in to fortify that sector and the services that they deliver to, the commu to communities. So on the nonprofit side, uh, we've, been, we've been killing it from the front of attracting more dollars than we've ever attracted in the history of the city. And there's two reasons why that's happening. If you go back three years ago, Jersey City in some ways was kind of like a no-fly zone from the uh, philanthropic side. We had Cory Booker on one side of us and we had Michael Bloomberg on the other side. Nobody really was looking at Jersey City. It was very difficult to get attention for Jersey City. And so it's obviously changed some degree and we've been able to really kind of capitalize on that. So what we have done um, over the last year, year and a half is, I, and I'm hyper engaged in it myself, as is one of our deputy mayors, as is Carmen, is literally pitching personally some of the largest foundations. Bloomberg came as a byproduct of us being involved over a year. Robert Wood Johnson we're working with for the first time. Um, we're launching something that we just raised $2 million for, for a, uh, it'll be the fastest EMS 911 response time, ambulatory response time in the country, in the country. And uh, we raised $2 million, we'll be the first ones to do it. Right now we have a five minute response time, which happens to be the fastest in the country. It's gonna drop down to three minutes based on Israeli technology that they use, uh, United Hatzala is what it's basically called. So the way that works, ultimately, nonprofit as well, is, uh, is technology and GPS tracking allows you to recognize who's in close proximity prior to an ambulance coming. So if you think of it from this standpoint here, if somebody was in the cafeteria right next to us here, right, and students starts choking, per se, 
Most of us in this room wouldn't know it until the ambulance comes through here and actually uh, you see the ambulance coming through. And there's more than likely, actually I do know, that there are doctors in this room who could help that situation out immediately. If the doctor knew here, they'd be here in less than a minute in that situation. You could potentially save a life. Same thing with hearts, same thing with a lot of immediate type of things that we're responding to. So what we're doing in Jersey City for the first time with Barnabas is we have 200 people going through the first class of this, getting certified, getting all the equipment, and their phones, the app that they have on their phones, recognizes that when the call comes into 911, it'll recognize immediately that Ben is certified and Ben is sitting right here and it will tell Ben that in the room next to you there is an issue. So Ben will come over there in 30 seconds, the ambulance will still route, and we will hand over to the ambulance somebody who's already been getting treatment for some time. It's a nonprofit we're doing, we've raised a lot of money for it, so I just highlight that we are working with the nonprofit sector in a, tr in, in a very significant way. Um, the first year that we were there, it's taken some time to weed through the nonprofits, which ones were the high quality providers and some of the lower quality providers. And that, take a, that was some tough conversations. And I think now we're kind of in a place where we know where the better providers are and we're, and we're working with them to kind of escalate the funding. So it's kind of been in two phases, the first year and the second year. Yes. Mayor Matt Watkins from West New York. And uh, just wanted to ask the program that you and Governor McGreevy are doing is how's, what's the reception within the community to put that kind of focus on, on you know, those who have been incarcerated returning to the community? A lot of times I know in my work we see that there's some objection to that. I'm just curious as to what yeah. your experience has been. I, initially, it's a, it's a, it's a NIMBY tour sort of conversation where people didn't want to have the headquarters initially. We have to go through some political landmines because they didn't want to have the headquarters, which we call Martin's Place, um, in their respective community. And we had to go through the conversation to make sure that people understand that Martin's Place, which is where a lot of people leaving the jail system, ex-convicts are coming to, is actually a safe place because the people who are walking through those doors are people who want help and don't want to go back to the prison system. But that is a conversation that needed to happen over some time. There was some pushback on that. You also get into the conversation about the dollars we spend on those 2,000 people. They would say, well, why are you focusing resources on people that they would say are criminals when you should be focusing on the non-criminals? I would tell you that those 2,000 people, despite being 1% of the population, have a disproportionate impact on the greater community as it relates to what they do. So fixing that 2,000 people, that 1% of the population, has a huge positive impact overall. It hasn't always been easy because not everybody understands and the knee-jerk reaction is why are you putting money there? Um, you know, th over the next two years, we're gonna do what we think is right conviction-wise. You know, to highlight one last story, and I think this kind of, uh, and then we'll wrap it up, I guess we'll wrap it up on that, on that point, is, um, you know, I told you earlier, Women's History Month, I told you about my grandmother's situation, and uh, mm -hmm. the best lesson I had um, and I guess shaping me and what I don't want to be in public sector or politics happened actually when I was running for council. And uh, you know, I was running against the political machine, so I was outside of the whole Hudson County infrastructure and uh, running for council against an incumbent and I get a phone call from a uh, leader in the Pakistani community to come and meet with him. And uh, I didn't really know what to expect. I didn't know a lot of people in the Pakistani community at the time. And uh, I went to the mosque and 25 people there and uh, we had a great conversation. I would meet with anybody because nobody really knew who I was and the organization wasn't with me. So there was about 25 community leaders from the Pakistani community and uh, we had a conversation. They asked about a lot. I didn't know what to expect to be honest with you. And uh, it was shortly after 9-11. I had all sorts of stereotypes in my head that weren't right. And uh, you know, we went in there and they asked about things that everybody else asked about, the same exact things that this room is asking about. And they asked about traffic and schools and um, opportunities and jobs. And we left. And uh, well, I got up to leave after the conversation. And the imam says, Fulop. He says, that's a strange last name. He says, what kind of last name is that? What are you? And uh, I thought about it. And I should have said at the time I was Jewish. I knew what he, I knew what he was asking. And uh, I said at the time that I was Eastern European. And I felt so bad about myself when I left. I felt that if my grandmother heard me say that, she would roll over in her grave. And I said that, you know, I never wanted to be that person again. 
I tell you, two weeks later, it was a Jewish holiday, and the imam called me up to wish me a good holiday. And he's a better person, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a better man than I am, in the sense that uh, all the judging and stereotypes that I thought, and I thought I had to be something that I wasn't, um, you know, I learned the lesson there that I said to myself, I'm never gonna do that again. So whether it's fighting with a community group that is politically not in my best interest, or the prisoner reentry thing, you know, in two years, you know, whatever I run for, if I run for re-election or run for something else, I'll run on my record what I thought was right and go from there. And I'm not going to make the same mistake I made in that imam. And thank God he was a better person than me. That's basically it. And, and with that, I'll say thank you for coming out today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming out. I greatly want to thank uh, the mayor for coming down. Everybody drive home safe. Uh, April 13th. We'll be talking about homeland security, so come on back. We look forward to seeing you. Thank you, everyone. What? I know.